Dear brothers and sisters, now one of the things that happens when you start to read through the Qur'an is that every time Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions the ugliness of a sin, He also mentions the way that the believers manifest another quality. So when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala condemns financial corruption, a riba, usury, and interest, and stealing, and all of those things, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions the believers, the zakati, fa'ilun, those who purify their wealth, and they purify themselves by spending of their wealth in ways that are noble, and make sure that they always earn in ways that are noble. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala condemns a zina, when He condemns adultery, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala praises those who guard their chastity. So there's always a beautiful counterpart to an ugly spiritual disease that Allah speaks about that can manifest both at the individual level and at the community level. And I wanted to speak about today what is, in my opinion, probably the most underestimated of the major sins of the kabah. Now, there's a, a toss-up here, whether it's between the sin that I'm going to speak about or a riba. But subhanAllah, this hadith always gives me pause because of the way that the Prophet ﷺ said what he said. And it's a hadith by the companion Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anhu, not Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu anhu, but another companion who is less known. And it's an authentic hadith where he says that the Prophet ﷺ said, أَلَا أَدُلُّكُمْ Shall I not show you what the worst of major sins is? Shall I not tell you what the worst of major sins is? And the Prophet ﷺ was always teaching. He said this alayhi salatu wasalam while he was reclining. So he's talking to his companions and teaching them even while he's reclining. And he says, shall I not tell you what the worst of major sins is? And the companions say, bala ya Rasulullah, yes, O Messenger of Allah. So he said, sallallahu alayhi wasalam, first and foremost, a shirk. Then he said, sallallahu alayhi wasalam, wa uququl walidayn. And to disobey your parents, to harm your parents, to violate the right of Allah upon you, then to violate the right of your parents upon you. Then he said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and to bear false testimony, and to bear false testimony, and to bear false testimony. He said it three times, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, while he was in that position, in that posture. Now, if you hear those things, the one that seems the least scary is false testimony. What does it mean to bear false testimony? I never went to court, hopefully never went to court and, you know, bore false testimony. What does that even mean? But the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi saying that three times, in and of itself, should catch your attention. And then Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anhu says, he was, he was reclined and then he sat up Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He kept on repeating it until we got it. Beware of false testimony. To the point that Abu Bakr says, we wish that he would stop Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, not because we don't like hearing him, not because we're not heeding the warning, but it's like he's tiring himself, alayhi salatu wasalam, trying to impress upon us. Be careful with bearing false witness. Be careful with bearing false witness. What is false witness and how do we see it manifesting both at the political level, in the global arena, as well as in our personal lives. Now the opposite is Allah Azza wa says, those who are upright with their testimony. They are upright. You don't fear that they will ever lie, no matter how consequential the truth is. And there's a connection here, that the believers live the truth no matter what the consequences are, both in terms of tawheed and abiding by the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and believing in God no matter what persecution comes with that. To say la ilaha illallah no matter what persecution comes with that. To abide by your principles no matter how far the society around you has drifted from those principles. To stay upon your way no matter how strange that makes you. So you are not afraid of the consequences of truth. Why do people lie sometimes? Because they're afraid of the consequences of telling the truth. There's a clear benefit to lying. So Allah Azza wa Jalla situates this within the resume of a believer. They will never lie in their testimony not to benefit someone else or to benefit themselves because they fear the consequences of that lie on the day of judgment far more than they fear the consequences of that truth here. They will stick to it. They are upright. They can be trusted. Now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes Ibadul Rahman the servants of the Most Merciful, and we can build on it inshaAllah ta'ala, and why the Prophet sallallahu is impressing this upon us so much, and what the applications of that are today. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَالَّذِينَ لَا يَشْهَدُونَ الزُّورِ A people who do not bear false testimony, do not witness false testimony. And when they come across vain speech, idle speech, they proceed with dignity. They leave with their honor intact. In this situation, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also situates false testimony with people who spare themselves, who spare themselves of gatherings or groups where they're going to diminish their own honor by being a part of those groups. So back in the day, that meant passing by a gathering or a gathering taking a long turn, a wrong turn. Now it's your WhatsApp group, now it's your social media. You know, your algorithm tailors to you. So if you're only seeing nasty people, it's not a very good sign about where you've taken yourself to. If everyone on your feed talks a certain way, right, or interacts in a certain way, then that means that the, the shaytanic algorithm has figured you out 
that that's what speaks to your, your insight. That's what speaks to you. You like that stuff, right? So let me feed you more of what you like. And so you continue to diminish your own honor while taking from the honor of someone else. So similarly, to Surah Al-Hujurat, here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala situates false testimony in that. Now, why is it that the Prophet sallallahu spoke about this the way that he did? And why is it that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala places this sin alongside a shirk? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, leave off the worship of idols and leave off, leave off that false testimony. Because the scholars say that false testimony is usually of another degree of severity. And this is where I want you to pay attention. Your lies have consequences on people's lives. Your lies have consequences on people's lives. Once you share something, you own it. Once you retweet, you own it. Once you forward, you own it. And if that is not true, if there is a lie in there and it has a consequence to someone else's life, unfortunately, that's shahadat tazur. That is false testimony. And so the scholars say that false testimony is a lie that brings about an oppression. And there is no greater oppression than shirk. It's the lie that's told that an oppression is built upon. A dhulm is then built upon. And there is no greater oppression than shirk. You put out a lie that has consequences. The consequences of that lie can never be walked back. That is shahada to zur. That is exactly what false testimony is, to see it in its most evil manifestation. What happens when I pass something on? What happens when I pass something on carelessly that involves someone else's life and I have not done my due diligence to verify it as truth? And then it has a consequence on that person's life. Even if you were not in front of a judge and standing in a courtroom, you better believe that you will one day stand in front of the judge in a great courtroom, the court of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and he himself will be the judge. And you will not be able to say, well, it looked like it was real, or everyone else was saying it. Careful, dear brothers and sisters. Imagine the Prophet sallallahu I am to you like a father, I teach you. Imagine the Prophet sallallahu in front of you and saying, Allah wa qawla zuhr. Be careful with bearing false witness. Be careful with passing on a lie that can have a consequence on someone else's life. Be careful with your recklessness. Be upright, even if you think that the person that's being spoken about, and this is so important, our Prophet wasallam never lied about the people of Mecca, even after they ran him out of Mecca, and even after they killed his relatives, and they did to him every form of evil that you can imagine. The Prophet wasallam never reciprocated their lies, their tactics, their methodology, because we have to be better than them. We can't cede the moral ground. We can't cede the moral ground. So the Prophet ﷺ didn't go around and say, hey, let me tell you about Abu Jahl and what I heard about Abu Jahl. Let me tell you about Abu Lahab and what I heard about Abu Lahab. None of that. In fact, subhanAllah, one of the most powerful lessons we take from the seerah is that the people that were persecuting the Prophet ﷺ in Mecca, they left their precious belongings with as sadiq al-Amin even after they persecuted him because they knew that the Prophet ﷺ would not do away with their precious belongings even as they took away the most precious people to him. Can you imagine if you're the Prophet ﷺ and you have Abu Jahl's watch with you? And what does the Prophet ﷺ do? When he leaves Mecca, he sends Sayyidina Ali ta'ala anhu. He says, go return back the amanat, the trusts of all of these people. Even though he's fleeing their attempted murder, I will not be like them. I will not excuse myself to act like them no matter what they did to me. Because we are not like them. And in his own personal life, وسلم, take the amanat back. Now I want you to think about this. How many secrets in 40 years do you think the Prophet ﷺ had about Abu Lahab and Abu Jahl and about these people that he could have destroyed them with by passing it out in public? How many things do you think they took him? The most approachable human being in the world ﷺ. How many times do you think they took the Prophet ﷺ aside and they could talk to him when they could talk to no one else? And you think if the Prophet ﷺ did not give away their amanat, did not steal their amanat, the trusts of them, you think he would divulge their secrets? No, because we're different. We don't bear false testimony. We don't cede the moral ground. We don't become like the people who oppress us. We don't justify our own oppression by saying, well, the environment is as such. And there's a common thread with all of the major sins here, by the way. Zina, everybody commits zina. Riba, everybody does riba. Alcohol, everybody drinks khamar now. Everybody does this, everybody does that. Everyone talks like this, everyone does this, everyone does that. Stop looking to the person to your right and your left and thinking, well, if he's doing it or if she's doing it, Instead, ask yourself, am I willing to meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with it? Be careful, dear brothers and sisters. Lies have, have consequences on people's lives. Don't put your name on anything that you know is not true. Don't sign on anything that you know is not true. It might seem small, but it is big in the eyes of Allah, in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we see, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us from that evil and rid us of that evil all around the world. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us to see justice in this life and the next and to never be on the side of the oppressors in this life or in the next.